great. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us for the third and final webinar in our three-part series about the importance of water data, which has been facilitated by the Columbia Basin Water Hub and Living Lakes Canada. We'll start out today by introducing the Water Hub team. My name is Paige. I'm the Database and Community Engagement Coordinator with the Water Hub. I'm joining you today from Nelson, BC, which is on the traditional territories of the Sinaix, the Sikh, the Tanaha, and the Sequetmec peoples. I'll let Santiago introduce himself as well. All right. Thank you very much, Paige. Really appreciate the first words there. And as most of you may know, or some of you may know, my name is Santiago, and I'm the Applied Innovation and Technology Manager at Living Lakes Canada and the Columbia Basin Water Hub. I am speaking to you today from Casagar, British Columbia, and I would like to acknowledge that I live and work in the traditional territories of the Sanaiks, the Silks, the Tanaha, and the Sequekmet peoples. To get an idea of who is here today, please let us know where you're joining us from in the chat box just below there. Thanks. Pass it on to Paige. Thank you, Santiago. So yeah, as people continue to join, if you could just let us know who you are and where you're joining us from, that'd be great to get a sense of who's here. Looks like we've got people from around BC, uh, New Denver and Nelson and outside of the Columbia Basin in the South Okanagan, Ontario. We've got Rosslyn Streamkeepers here. We've got people from Toronto. Well, this is our farthest one yet, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and we've got someone from Newfoundland. So that's great to see the diversity of people attending. Um, before we get started, do note that there will be time for a question and answer session after all of the presentations are finished. So I encourage you to locate the Q&A function in your Zoom controls. As we move through the presentations, if you do have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box and we will answer your questions after all of the presentations are complete. We will be recording this session and the recording will be distributed with resource documents to all registrants of the webinar. You'll be able to find the recording on the Living Lakes Canada YouTube channel and website as well. So this is our third webinar in the Why Care About Water Data series hosted by Living Lakes Canada. Living Lakes Canada is a national nonprofit organization that is working towards the long-term protection of Canada's fresh water. Our mission is to elevate water stewardship through community-based water monitoring. We believe that this is a way to empower localized climate adaptation and provide support for decision-making by helping to fill important water data gaps. One of our current projects is the Columbia Basin Water Hub, a centralized repository for water data that Living Lakes developed in consultation with hydrologists, governments, First Nations, and water stewardship groups. We officially launched the Water Hub in March of this year. And through the Water Hub, we are making data accessible this data is necessary for adaptation to the climate crisis, watershed security, and environmental stewardship. We encourage you all to reach out to us if you have any questions or if you'd like to learn more about the Water Hub. So the goal of this three-part series is to provide our viewers with an overview of the importance of water data in the Columbia Basin and beyond. Our first session looked at climate change and the need for prioritized, coordinated water monitoring efforts. Last week, we heard about projects being undertaken by three water monitoring programs across the Columbia Basin. This week, we're going to focus on how the data that is collected can be applied and used. Data can guide policy creation, stewardship and remediation, natural asset valuation, allocation of resources, and more. Today, we'll hear from two guests, Jennifer Yao and Jason Schleppi, who will each share stories of how water data has made a difference. The Water Hub team will then facilitate some discussion around how we can increase the usage of water data for decision making. So first up today, we'll have Jennifer Yao. She got her degree in biology in Santa Cruz, California and worked as a microbiologist. After immigrating to Canada, she worked in commercial labs supervising the testing of food and water. When she moved to the Kootenays, she became involved with environmental issues and saw the need to monitor creeks that are subject to land use impacts. Her husband, Tony, who's also a lab person, learned hydrometric techniques, and with direction from government scientists and community participation, he began monitoring flow and water quality on creeks across the Kootenays. Their company, called Passmore Laboratory, is certified by the BC CDC to test drinking water and continues helping community groups interested in establishing water monitoring programs. So thank you for being here today, Jennifer. Thank you, Paige. Okay, so, Welcome to the Slocan Valley. 
the Spokane Valley is a glacial valley, as you can see in this first slide. And the unique thing about it is that uh, we've got these lovely mountains on either side of, a, of the valley. Uh, and the mountains uh, have small creeks flowing down from, from reservoirs, uh, natural reservoirs on top. And many people in the valley get their drinking water directly from these small creeks. Next slide. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm gonna go back a ways, two things, go back a ways to the beginning of uh, sort of the history here of water monitoring in the Slocan Valley, how it all began, because we've been doing it for quite a while. And then I'm going to hone in on uh, three uh, examples of where monitoring has directly affected a change in, in land management or forestry activities. But the first thing here is, is the history. And going back here to the early 90s, the Slocan Valley has been known for many things. And one is that the, the residents here uh, that live here often have very strong views about um, forestry, land protection, and maintaining the integrity of the, of the landscape. And what we found there back in the 90s when we were uh, having lengthy discussions, meetings, protests, blockades, when we were attempting to work with various government agencies and we would sit down, we realized we didn't have much information on the creeks that we used, knew, and loved. And so we decided that we'd be in a much stronger position if we had data that really just told us what the quality and quantity of uh, water in our creeks was. So we bought a little kit, and, and maybe you've heard of it, they're called hack kits. And we passed it around. I think at that time we had 14 different stations. We passed, passed it around throughout the valley. And over the course of a year, we collected quite a bit of data on hardness, acidity, alkalinity, pH, just sort of simple basic parameters that you would look for on creeks. And then we uh, took that data, turned it into a report and handed it to the uh, provincial government and asked for funding to do more extensive monitoring. And lo and behold, the timing was right. There was a program called Forest Renewal BC in place then. And so we did get funding to actually monitor the, the flow, um, turbidity, conductivity, a number of things on 11 creeks throughout the, the valley. And this picture shows the original creeks that were in that program. Now, what's interesting, some of these creeks, uh, we actually continue to be monitoring, uh, are monitored today. But when I look over the landscape, um, I think there has been um, development activity, certainly up in, in the upper valley there on Bonanza, but the, the um, effects, I can't honestly say it's just from the monitoring. There's a, quite a bit of, of um, um, ecological arguments and other arguments that people have put forth, but certainly monitoring was one of the, the tools that the community used to let the um, developers know that the streams were being watched and their activities on the ground were being watched. In fact, there were times when, when some of our uh, participants would walk up to the creeks where activities were happening and they'd be in their lab coat and bottle and they'd take a sample on either side of a road that was being built, just to sort of emphasize the fact that we're watching. Now, I'm talking sort of in generalities here because I can't really say that it's monitoring per se that led to the changes, but the changes have been significant over time. And one of the most significant changes from that era was the establishment of a community forest. 
that now oversees the monitoring of some of these creeks. And the other um, development has been uh, an increase in the, the um, quality of road building is what I'd say. Uh, and this is also partly because it's being watched. So going forward here, I'd like to now look at some of the specifics of where we could say our activities with monitoring have um, brought about a, a definite change in land practices. So let's go to the next slide. So the first example here is our dear friends on Wolverton Creek, and they have been monitoring. This, this was not in the original program. This was just a program that was um, initiated by the community and sponsored and paid for by the forest company. And actually, this is a pretty good arrangement because one of the components of this program was a yearly review of the practices up in the watershed. This is in addition to the, the monitoring. So the program again was carried out by the water users, but it was is, is funded by the forest company. And I should say is because this, this program continues. Okay, next slide. All right, now I'm uh, just wanting to say that there's a lot of work here involved here, but one of the things that's not normally tested in forestry uh, practices when you're looking uh, to uh, monitor the effects of forestry, you're not normally looking at bacteria. However, in this program we were because it was drinking water. And it came a point there, I think it was around 2008 or six, where we were noticing an increase in counts in fecal coli form. And we, um, it will actually it got to the point where one person got sick. So we uh, found at the end of the season when we did our yearly review that um, there were some faults in the road maintenance practices up in the upper levels of the watershed and road water was running directly into the creeks. And the thing that I, I'm pleased to report here is that the situation was remedied. In other words, the forest company went up and immediately um, ditched the roads properly. However, it's a reminder that, that activities way up in the watershed can have significant human health impacts. Okay, next slide. And here's a picture of the bacteria that I'm culturing in the lab. Originally, we were doing this in our basement. As time went on, we, were, we um, expanded to the garage, which is now a laboratory where we're running these tests daily for lots of community groups and cities. Okay, next slide. And here's an example. Actually, this was one that was taken from a graph that we did last year, but you can see that we do tend to see an increase in the fecal coles as the season goes on, whereas the blue lines, the total coliforms, stay around all season. And that means that if you are seeing fecal coles in their water, that means that you've got recent human or warm-blooded animal contamination. So we're pleased with the results of that event. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, the next one here is interesting because it was relatively short term. The group that initiated monitoring back in, again, early 2000s, was concerned about uh, logging in their uh, backyard. This was uh, in Slocan Park. And the credit here, as much as the monitoring, the credit here has got to go to the uh, Slocan Park residents who formed the society to um, monitor and to be on the ground when 
the um, bulldozers and the road crew was out there working. And I say that, and I emphasize the importance of that because in doing this, the, there's a relationship that develops between the residents who are obtaining their drinking water from these creeks and the, the actual um, contractors who are building the roads or doing the forestry. In this sense, being an activist group makes a difference. By activist, I mean boots on the ground, you, you're out there daily. And lo and behold, maybe the guy who's on that bulldozer is a neighbor of yours. And so in this instance, it was, it was quite interesting what we did here. And that was, we, we were just monitoring um, conductivity. And we'll go to the next slide here. Okay, conductivity, oh, we're measuring other things, but um, conductivity in this case is what we were measuring. And it's a simple test to do. You just have a little meter and you can look at the conductivity of the water. And we were measuring it at the water box where the folks were getting their water. And we would also hike up the hill into the forest where we suspected the creek was connected to this little spring that was feeding the water box. And so we were checking the conductivity here, uh, the water, and lo and behold, it turned out to be the same at the water box and up in the forest. And uh, that was a pretty good indication that the water in the forest at that site was the same water that was coming into the water box. And the folks, uh, went to the contractors, and I think it was BC Timber Sales who had this, this uh, particular tenure, and um, made the case of the importance for a leave zone. I mean, leave zones are obvious, but uh, they're not always instituted in the right way, and they are often not large enough, but in this case, because of the residents and the relationship that they developed with the, the contractors. They did create a leave zone for this particular creek. And I'm putting this, this slide in here with a picture of conductivity versus discharge as an example of how conductivity and flow are connected. In other words, if you go out with your little meter and you're taking your um, test regularly and you notice a big drop in the conductivity, that usually means an increase in flow. So in that sense, conductivity is a helpful surrogate for measuring flow. And then you can get a profile over the season of what the conductivity is versus the flow. In this case, it worked to their benefit because they got their creek protected. So we can go to the next slide. Here's the leave zone that was uh, put up to cover the area that was uh, feeding this little spring. Okay, next slide. Okay, this last one here is probably, well, yeah, it's probably the most dramatic, uh, obvious, uh, how the group, community group here, in this case, it's our Slocan River Streamkeepers, um, helped out and helped their community to assure that A, the sampling and testing was being done correctly, and B, that we were actually looking at long-term effects from this terrible disaster that happened in 2013 when over 30,000 liters of Jet A1 fuel went into one of the tributary creeks to the Slocan. So we could go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a side channel on the main on the, the stream that we started monitoring. But what I would say in this case is initially when this happened, there was a lot of um, concern, controversy. Uh, as to whether the government agencies uh, were actually uh, monitoring correctly. And so 
here, the regional district turned to Streamkeepers and asked us to offer to monitor people's wells. And so the offer went out, anyone who wanted their well monitored for hydrocarbons could let us take a sample and we would have it analyzed. So we went to some of the side streams and next slide here. Uh, this is a picture of the of the uh, Lemon Creek with the hydrocarbons on the surface. Okay, next slide. And sampling the side channels. This is something that we figured was important because um, the fuel had a way of getting into all of the um, wetlands and side channel that surround the floodplain of this creek. Okay, next slide. And one of, the, one of the things that we found in doing this was that as, as the time went on, um, we noticed eutrophication in some of the side streams and back channels wasn't there before. Breakdown from the hydrocarbons was creating nutrients that allowed algal growth. Okay, next slide. And these were some of the points the creek on the left there, or sorry, on the right is it was Lemon Creek coming down. Those red pointers are sites where we sampled, but in this instance, we sampled not just the, the waters right after the spill and not just the wells of concern to the residents. And by the way, we didn't see any hydrocarbon contamination in the wells. It did pass through fairly quickly there. Um, but the next uh, spring when we went out, this, these are samples that were collected the next uh, year. And what we did see this was hydrocarbon that were remnants from the, the initial spill. So it did carry over in the the season and our results in testing show the presence of hydrocarbons going out into next year. And in this instance, we our results differed from the um, studies that were done at the request of the government by the, the um, trucking company. Okay, next slide. This is just an example of what we did every time we had to collect a sample. And like you can see, there's over 20 different uh, parameters that you're looking at. And in this case, these are all wells and they all are less than. However, I would point out, and this is what we had to say to residents, is that in situations like this, the, your nose is actually more sensitive than the instruments that are doing these tests. So over time, we told residents to just do a, a more qualitative test where they put a bit of water in a jar, seal it, let it warm up, and then smell. If they smelled something, they should not drink the water. However, we might not see it on a test. However, going back to our uh, original testing here in the next year, we, because we were coming up with findings that were different than the um, trucking company, we were asked to go to court. And so we realized as a community group that we, as a, um, what is it? Well, we're community, members of the community. We are not scientists as the people in the, report from the um, trucking company were scientists. So we had to make sure that we crossed our T's and dotted our I's. And this is an example of where if your community group is doing monitoring, the importance of following standard methods, doing your quality control, making sure that you've got all the data in order so that if you do, have to go to court, you're prepared. Fortunately, we didn't have to, it didn't go that far, but we were prepared in this case. And the thing that came out of this that I could say was positive 
was a working relationship that we developed with the regional district and we are always thankful for that. Okay, next slide. So I'm, I'm talking now going forward and um, I talked about this terrible um, spill, but actually we've got something right now on our Slocan River. This is a pretty serious situation and it's on one of the main, main tributaries, which is the Little Slocan feeds into the main river, but because of intense forestry and um, faulty management of the floodplain in regards to how the, the water is channeled, um, there's a constant pressure on an unstable geologic form on the west, uh, sorry, on the, on the south uh, slope of the Little Slocan. And so we have quite a big challenge ahead of us because a lot of us live, there's a number of us that live on the, the uh, south slope of the Little Slocan. This house is no longer, but my house where I'm talking to you from is just down the road here. And I'm on the same cane terrace as are many of us. And so we, a, want to see changes in how this watershed is managed. And so our approach here is to work with the same people, basically the same people that we worked with back in the 90s. Now, back in the 90s, the beginning here, we had what was called an ecosystem-based plan for the entire Slocan watershed. And it never completely realized. However, components of it were recognized. Going forward, we don't now call it an ecosystem-based plan. They're called nature-based plans, but the concept and the science is the same. And so, like I said, going forward, we are hopeful that we can bring about this kind of a plan, not just for the Little Stokan, but for the whole valley. And we're hopeful because uh, of our past work and relations with uh, the government and the, and the studies that we've done, and especially with the regional district. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so, summary, what have we learned? A, and the most important thing is, if you're a community-based group and you want to do this kind of work, it's really essential to forge a relationship with the, with the company that is in your watershed or and, and or the government agency that is responsible and also with the construction crew on the ground, essential. Second, carry out sampling and analysis to recognize standards. This is kind of a no-brainer, but it's essential too, because as I pointed out with the lemon experience, you've got to have your quality control in order. And a third and probably one of the most important points here is if you've got a group like the Data Hub that we're uh, working with here, this giving this presentation, then you know that you've got some weight behind you when you uh, enter that data. In other words, there's credibility there that works to your benefit when you're working with the various parties. Okay, I think that's it and I'm open to questions. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer. So if anyone has any questions for our presenters, if they can just add them to the Q&A box, we will cover them at the end. So next up, we've got Jason Schleppi. He has 16 years of environmental experience and is a principal consultant with Ecoscape. His range of projects spans a broad spectrum, including fisheries research, environmental land use planning, environmental impact assessments, and watershed management. Jason is a leader in the province in the development of foreshore inventory and mapping, or FIM, a methodology that is being used to guide land use planning and development related activities along shoreline areas. Jason's experience with environmental inventory has helped many local governments to adapt and better manage water courses in their jurisdiction 
through incorporation of FIM data into local government policies, such as official community plans. Thank you, Jason, for speaking with us today. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start my screen share here so I can begin my presentation. So just give me a couple seconds while I sort my technology. Um, yes. Do the screen. Share. And slideshow. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Jason Shopping. I'm with Ecoscape Environmental. Um, I attended my undergrad at UBCO here in Kelowna, although it was Okanagan University College at the time. From there, I wanted to do my master's um, at the University of Lethbridge with a focus on parasites and fathead minnows, and particularly on male sexual behavior as it relates to parasite load. From there, in the late 90s, early 2000s, couldn't find a job and went on to go take a, the water quality program at uh, Okanagan College. Um, I have been mapping lake shorelines since the very beginning, and my presentation today is going to talk a little bit about the history of FIM, where we came from, and uh, the importance of the data collection and how it can aid uh, shoreline planning and just environmental land use planning in general at all levels of government or through stakeholders um, as has been previously talked about. So history of foreshore inventory and mapping. In 2004, the regional district central Okanagan in combination with the community mapping network um, branch of Fisheries Ocean Canada undertook the first iteration of FIM. They mapped the central regions of Okanagan Lake and it was largely an adaptation of the sensitive habitat inventory and mapping protocols developed by Brad Mason and Rob Knight, um, or more commonly referred to as, as SHIM. SHIM has been used, you know, um, for the term's been used for to have different meanings throughout time and um, you know, a good summary of that is available in one of the references listed here um, as well, reference number two. So after 2004, the City of Kelowna had some Fisheries Act authorization processes that they were working on and Fisheries Justice Canada wanted them to better understand what the individual values of different shoreline segments were. And so um, I was the company I work for at the time, EBA um, Consulting Engineers and Scientists, which is now Tetratech, was retained by the city to utilize the FIM data and sample fish and rank the different shoreline types within FIM, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, and sort of using fish presence data to help rank the shoreline. This was the first iteration of a sensitivity index and was used to sort of facilitate some Fisheries Act authorizations, which never actually came to be. Following that, um, sort of in the, you know, the, the early, early to mid 2000s, um, a bunch of lakes were started, Windermere was started, sort of leveraging the RDCO um, template. At the same time in the Okanagan, there was a desire to begin mapping more of the other lakes um, around. And so in 2007, uh, Brad Mason Community Mapping Network, myself, and some of the local governments sort of formed a working group and updated the draft for shore inventory and mapping methods. And there it sat from 2007-ish until last year when the methods were updated and finally finalized from a draft format. So, you know, in the 2007 to 2020 period, there was lakes all across the province done. Um, lots where Shushwap was done, Moi, Monroe, Mabel, Mara, uh, Columbia, um, Sulcan was done. So, you, you know, there's, there's thousands of kilometers of lake shoreline. Me, myself, I've participated probably into close to 4,000 kilometers of shoreline, plus or minus. I actually haven't of late gone back and done a, an update, but um, you know, I've seen a lot of shorelines and so the method has adapted. In, in 2020, um, Living Lakes Canada received the grants and again, embarked upon the rather onerous mission actually of sort of formalizing these methods into a, into a final, you know, here's, here's the method and to get it out of that draft format. So why would people want to do or undertake FIM? There's, you know, there was a lot of reasons back in the, the you know, around the 2004 era um, that was driving the rationale as to why. 
local government, particularly in the Okanagan and, and sort of the, the rampant rate of development here had you know, identified a need to have a more integrated shoreline planning process, tie that to their official community plans. At the same time, non-compliance was readily apparent. Um, at the same time, provincial agencies were also documenting non-compliance at a very rapid rate as an example, and don't quote me on these numbers, but when we mapped Shushwap Lake, it was 11 or 12 days of straight field work. Um, and from 11 days of field work, I believe DFO opened up over 200 um, non-compliance, uh, you know, observations from a, a mere 11 or 12 days of field work. So I'm going to show you the extent of non-compliance, um, you know, and non-compliance could have been active machinery working below the high watermark, crown land encroachments. You could, you could pick a type of non-compliance and I could show many, many pictures. Um, point being, at all levels of government, Transport Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, you know, non-compliance was readily, uh, readily observed and FIM became a great way to document the extent of urbanization along our shorelines and sort of understand how and what land uses were driving some of these impacts and then turn around and use that data to inform new policy. So that's sort of the whys behind, you know, why, you know, people wanted to do this. And then at the end of this, there's all, you know, within the sort of the FIM process, stakeholders played a major component of, you know, embarking upon and getting this mapping protocol done for a variety of different lakes. So this, this entire process has always had sort of this, you know, public, private, stakeholder, nonprofit, um, collaboration to help collect the data and help better manage our shorelines. So what I had done prior to the finalization of the methods was look at land use. After having worked on so many lakes myself and had access to data that other lakes had been done, um, we undertook some analyses to look at, you know, why or what different land uses are, would be driving, you know, impact. And so what I did is I pooled data from across all the lakes because the data could be combined and stacked vertically. And we looked at what the percent disturbance is. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm sort of moving along the Y axis here and what the different land uses are. And what becomes readily apparent in this is when you transition from a rural land use to a more dense land use like single family or multifamily or industrial, you see this big jump in disturbance along a shoreline. And so, you know, this is sort of a key, key sort of bigger picture view of, you know, what is the broader impact of different land use types? And this data is extremely useful because it can guide land use planners at local government who oftentimes are the first stop for making land use decisions above the high watermark. What it does is it can give them an idea of what may happen in the future. If we rezone from rural, as an example, to single family, what is our expected level of impact? And so the data is useful in that sense in that you can pool the data and begin to plan ahead and look much farther into the future, not two, three, four, five years, but in a hundred years, if we rezone this from rural to single family, as an example, what would be our expected level of impact? And so, Data like this was you know, the driving reason behind why we wanted to update the methods and create a scenario where this data could be pooled and, and stored and used to help aid some of these decisions and provide concrete evidence of things to help guide policy in documents like official community plans. So to sort of highlight this as an example, we used data from Okanagan Lake and old air photos and had the three surveys and basically developed a simple logistic regression model and set our time frame, our time zero, you know, 100 years ago and said, okay, 100 years ago, we were, our assumption was zero impact, hence that data point, that is a faux data point to help make the regression itself work. But you can see on Okanagan, these, these lower points at around 50% disturbance, this is the transition point when you go from you know, rural up to single family or a more, more dense land use. And this curve is, is pretty indicative. And so you can kind of see that this curve mimics the same shape that you sort of see here with other land uses. And obviously I could rearrange the bar graphs and sort of show that, but 
it makes the point that land use and land use decisions are a driving impact behind what are impacts along a shoreline that we may observe after time. So FIM in that sense is truly sort of a cumulative impact assessment. Where are we, are, where we, are, where are, we to are today in terms of um, you know, what the impacts are? So now I'm gonna to transition to a little bit about the method itself. Um, I've sort of given you the background on the whys and sort of the driving factors behind, you know, why, why would we undertake more data collection? What do we get from this? Um, and sort of the driving factor behind finalizing the methods. The, the FIM, like the foreshore integrated map management planning process or FIMP is sort of a three-step process. The first process is, is the FIM component, foreshore inventory and mapping. In this component, you collect data for each lake segment. So a lake is broken up into parts and pieces and for each segment, which has a similar geomorphological shore type or land use, you collect data. You collect data on what the land use is. Is it single family, multifamily? industrial, a natural area or conservation area, urban park, natural park, you know, all the different land use types. You also collect data on what riparian conditions are, um, as well as substrates for both the uh, foreshore region and the littoral zone. Um, at the same time, there's a whole suite of shoreline modifications that are collected. So how many docks, how many groins, which are perpendicular structures to the shoreline that affect sediment movement. So there's all this data that's collected, and I honestly don't know how many columns there is, but it's a very extensive, you know, database. This is all typically done from a boat um, and through use of air photos and other things and data is collected. At the same time, when you're out, you'll also want to use your conservation data center data, those kind of things, and document areas of shore spawning, maybe from DFO or self-collected, or, or you know, identify other habitat values that exist independent of sort of the biophysical conditions documented in the FIM database. All this data is rolled up into step two, which is a foreshore habitat sensitivity index. This index is arguably a very simple index where data from FIM and other habitat attributes, shore spawning, kokanee, or landlocked sockeye as an example. I mean, if you were in Ontario, you could be talking about, you know, um, weed beds where, where northern pike spawn as another example, right? This is just one example of, of habitat. These, these data points get built into the foreshore habitat sensitivity index and are basically ranked. Um, you know, ranging between zero and one, one being it has very high value, zero being it, it doesn't have, have any value. It's a simplistic ranking system, but is very efficient and effective at quickly identifying where the different values are along the shoreline. Ultimately, this gets rolled up into a five class ranking system that ranks between very high, high, moderate, low, and very low. And so this sort of gives a lake-wide assessment of where the most sensitive areas are along a shoreline and um, helps identify areas that would be, you know, recommended for conservation or where land use decisions such as rezoning from single fam or rural to single family may have a much greater risk. So coupled with this, you also create what are called zones of sensitivity. And these are areas where you know, you have a discrete value for a particular species as an example that is important. Um, in the Okanagan, one example would be the Rocky Mountain Ridge Mussel. There is known occurrences and, um, you know, they're, they're up for, for listing under Sarah. That's just one example. Shore spawning kokanee would be another one, but you can pick and choose, right? I mean, uh, juvenile rearing areas for sturgeon would be another good example. So there's all sorts of different values that could be put here. Wildlife corridors, uh, rare ecosystems that occur along the shoreline to get built into these zones of sensitivity. The third step of the process is to take all of these different data sets and roll them up into a foreshore development guide, which basically looks at different land use activities, docks, groins, marinas, water intakes, you know, very common things that proponents may want to propose along a piece of shoreline. And identifies using the, the, the zones of sensitivity or the habitats, uh, the FHSI, uses them to sort of create a, a ranking of risk. This ranking of risks aids proponents because they can look at these documents themselves and decide, do I really want to go forward with an application that is likely going to have you know, limited chance of success because of the, the risk associated with it. It also aids agencies in their review process. So 
that's sort of the Coles Notes version of the three-step process. And I'm sure that uh, Santiago can put up some links there for, for sort of the methods document itself. Um, you know, and people can take a gander. So this is sort of the method, right? And the three-step process. Um, this three-step process has been bought into by Fisheries Nurses Canada, you know, Ministries, uh, Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations, Rural Development in BC, um, and sort of local government as a good way to help everybody work together. So the next part of the, you know, FIM has an inherent ability to incorporate First Nations data. Um, for this First Nations data, their, you know, traditional uh, ecological knowledge is usually the, the, the first and foremost data that can be included. And basically, this data is acquired from First Nations if they're willing to share it. Um, there may be data sharing agreements or other things and gets can be incorporated directly into the uh, FHSI or, or, or zones of sensitivity. However, it's important to note that cultural data should not be included because it's sort of a different type of data and would be better included in sort of its own type of management plan. So FIM in and of itself inherently can incorporate and work with and help uh, uh, First Nations as well identify values that they deem important to be included. So that's sort of the, the process in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to show some maps now of, you know, sort of what the data looks like when it comes out. So this is sort of a summary of the FIM map. And this is a very busy piece of the, you know, the, the, the north end of Windermere Lake near the outlet and shows an example of things that can be identified in FIM. You can see we have data pins for docks, boat launches, um, you know, land use data would be collected. You have known spawning zones for kokanee, all of the freshwater, you know, mussel observations, as well as an old weir that, that is very observable. And if you aren't careful, you can hit your prop on. Um, so, you know, this is an example of a map set. And obviously this is a very busy portion of the lake, but, you know, every lake will sort of have its own different fish habitat or wildlife observations and, and you know, the modifications mapping. The foreshore habitat sensitivity index is basically a similar map set, but rolls up the data into different broad categories, ecosystems, fish, waterfowl, as an example, wildlife, and you can sort of create these, these zones of sensitivity and identify the foreshore habitat sensitivity index. And so this is an example of what the map sets look like. Um, I mean, obviously, every lake is going to have its own suite of sensitivity, but the FHSI ranking itself will be independent. And it's fully plausible that there may not actually be these particular zones of sensitivity on a given lake. These are just if identified. So this is an example of sort of how the mapping products roll out. And this is from Windermere Lake data, which was collected last year. But in general, even the previous iterations of FIM have very similar map sets and the data is directly transferable to the new method. The new method is not very different, rather it is just a formalization of the way things have been done and addition of new parameters, particularly modifications and other things that, you know, people, people over time has, have identified as things that we care about. So how are people using this data? Well, local government will often use this data in official community plans and bylaws. They'll use it to guide land use decisions at the staff or council level, and it also helps them interact and engage with stakeholders. Um, so that, that's a common use of data there. Provincial government can use the data in compliance audits. They can use it in policy development or, you know, the new Water Sustainability Act, as an example in British Columbia, could use it in a water sustainability plan. I'm not familiar with everybody else's, you know, um, uh, you know, other provincial policies, but at the end of the day, I'm sure that there's other mechanisms where this data could be included. And for the federal government, it's it's largely the same, right? They can use it in compliance. I've seen Fisheries Action Canada use this when, you know, Fisheries Act violations occur. They go back to the data sets. It helps them identify what is there, right? It also helps them guide policy, land altering decisions, and interact with stakeholders as well. So this is often how government agencies are using it. At the same time, stakeholders could use the data for the exact same reasons. Um, so where can people get their hands on FIMP data? Local government, if it's been done, oftentimes they'll have data viewing portals or access to reports for lakes that fit within their jurisdiction. Living Lakes Canada has all the data posted on the FIMP portal of the Water Hub. And so the Water Hub is another great place to have access to, to get this data. And Santiago will have the details of exactly how that works. At the same time, DFO is still has the community mapping network up and running. 
and that data can also be accessed there on viewing portals and it may also be available for download you would need to, to check with the community mapping network and so it's important when people use this data they need to acknowledge the the standards of the fim collection methods they need to also acknowledge any limitations of data collection right fim is not a one to 200 view of the lake it is it is a larger assessment of the lake in its whole uh, you know, in its whole entirety, and there's often limitations to the data. Um, you know, another important thing to remember is is the the FHSI ranks the shoreline relative to other areas of the shoreline. It's not directly transferable to another lake, but rather when we look at Windermere Lake as an example, the FHSI identifies the highest value areas on Windermere Lake but that same FHSI cannot be used on a different lake. Each lake is unique. Each lake has its own set of data that goes with it to support the FHSI and users of the data need to be cognizant of that. Um, so that's all I have you know, to present today. Um, I hope I did a good job. I am like a deer in a headlights. I think I'm used to normally seeing people's faces and sort of giving these kind of things in person. This is the first one I've done online, but I do hope that I was able to sort of pass along some of my, my, my FIM slash FIM knowledge and I'm open to helping or open to taking any questions. At the end of the day, the more data we have regarding our shorelines and land use and risk, the better we can manage. And I see a huge long-term benefit to the Columbia Basin Water Hub in the sense that as more lake data gets collected, even across Canada, hopefully, um, we can then begin to pool these data sets and start identifying regional trends or other, other sorts of trends. So I thank you for your time and I'll take some questions and hopefully I didn't go over time. Thank you so much, Jason. It's great to get some more information on the FIMP protocols and methods. So we did want to pose a question to the group while we have everyone here. We've been talking a lot today about data and how it can be used. And we wanted to ask the group, what do you feel is the biggest barrier to water data being used for decision-making? So this is a poll and anyone who's watching here can answer this question. And if you have any other ideas, you can let us know in the chat box. I'll just give people a few moments here to select an answer. All right, so right now it looks like most people are saying that the biggest barrier to water data being used is that the data that they need does not exist, which is closely followed by the data not being accessible to those who need it. We'll just give people another moment here to answer if they have any last minute ideas and you are welcome to add some comments in the chat as well if you have any ideas. All right, it looks like most people have submitted an answer here so we can look at our results. And again, most responders said that the data is either not accessible or does not exist that they're looking for. So hopefully that's something that we can resolve through databases like the Water Hub. And we can move on now to our Q&A session. It looks like we had a couple of questions from viewers. The first one here is directed towards Jason. Corey is wondering, do you think the tools available to local governments, specifically development permit areas to restore and enhance fish habitat and riparian areas are adequate to reverse the disturbance that has taken place along heavily developed shoreline areas? Do you think there are ways that local governments could better utilize these tools to protect riparian areas? Uh, thank you for the question, Corey. Um, local government. Development permit areas are a great tool to start a process. However, effective restoration comes when local government identifies explicit targets for their expectations, okay? Um, me, myself, on an urban lot, I tend to lean towards sort of a restoration target of 25 to 30% if it's assumption is a hundred percent turf to the shoreline as you know an example of a target but local government needs to 
actively identify and set targets. They need to be explicit in what they want. And so what I'd say is if we can impact a shoreline through a thousand little tiny cuts, each individual lot being a cut through a thousand little tiny band-aids, we can start to put it back together again, right? But DPs are a great start, but without a specific target, it actually becomes more challenging because if there isn't an explicit requirement, then landowners can push back and say, I don't want to, right? So, you know, and I, having worked on many applications like that, I think it's an important part to think of. So hopefully that answers your question. It is possible. I think it helps, but without targets getting into policy, then you can run into problems with achieving your end goals. That's great. Thank you. There's another question here from Jason Carter. What enforcement of protection of species at risk habitat can take place on private land with non-communicative landowners? Uh, is that question directed towards uh, FIM or who's who's asking? I think who's, that is that directed towards me? Maybe? I think it is if you if you have okay. an answer, but we can also follow up on that one in the follow up email. Okay. I mean, Species at risk, as I've heard from Environment Canada, does not apply on private land, which I find interesting. But at the same time, they also have a hammer where they can say, but oh, we can step in and stop things if we see a concern. That is a loaded question and a tough one to actually answer. It is an ongoing debate in my world as to how enforceable that piece of legislation is on private property. Great, thank you. We've got one more question here about FIMP, which is, is FIMP regulated to be used in local government shoreline decision making, or can the government in ignore FIMP? Most local governments have the choice as to whether or not they incorporate FIMP type planning into their process. Um, preferably they do, but ultimately staff and council would make those those decisions so can they ignore it yes however it's best is where the stakeholders and community groups come in by lobbying staff and politicians because they're the ones that can effectively implement change and say hey we care about our shoreline we like this it's a good plan it helps better manage and so that it well they don't have to it gives a mechanism and tool for residents and you know concerned stakeholders to identify and help bring local government along to what this desires and politicians to what the desires of the residents are james james lee is asking has any agency considered remote sensing as a new way of monitoring water quality jason you want to take i can also speak to that a little bit I can take that on. Um, I'm I'm a GIS uh, geographic information systems bachelor's degree just very recently, and so I have seen various approaches for water quality monitoring uh, using drones, uh, more specifically, and multispectral cameras. What I've seen so far is for monitoring various different um, various different growth for phytoplankton and lakes, and so that's what I've seen the most, and also around. Um, invasive species, and I know that doesn't relate directly to, uh, let's say, water quality, but some correlations may be done there, and I'll dive a little bit deeper, and um, if you can maybe leave the email, I'd love to chat more about that, because uh, I'm all about remote sensing, seeing how we can apply it in water. I've seen that people are calculating flow right now using uh, aerial imagery and seeing how wide there, um, the stream is, and so I have an old school plug, so I'm going to stop it there, because it's going to keep ringing. As I hope that answers your question, James. Thank you. James responded there and said, my colleague did a study for Lake Ontario using remote sensing and AI for water quality. So that's something we would probably be interested in having a look at if you wanted to send that along to us. And Jennifer, I was wondering if you could give us an update on the Lemon Creek situation, if that's been resolved or if it's still ongoing. Yes, we do continue to monitor Lemon Creek. We've, we do mainly the cabin protocol and we've seen that it's um, come back to, to normal in terms of the benthic invertebrates. So, uh, but uh, over the long term, the effects on the river, uh, no, we're not, 
we're not doing the larger study. All right, well, that's great to hear that the yeah. cabin results are coming back more normally. The creatures. Um, I think that is all of the Q&A that we have here, unless anyone has any last minute questions. And if you do have any questions after the presentations, you're welcome to contact us by email as well. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We do appreciate your time and attention as we looked at the applications of water data. Thank you to our sponsors, including RBC, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, the Columbia Basin Trust, Watersheds BC, the Sitka Foundation, and the Vancouver Foundation for making the series possible. We'll follow up early next week with a webinar package that includes the resources mentioned in today's session, as well as a recording of the webinar. Here at the Water Hub, we do love using webinars to bring ideas and people together. So this is our second series of many to come. Follow Living Lakes on social media or check our website to stay up to date. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.